Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to be back on the record here in Fremont County, Idaho. It's the 3rd of August, 2020. It's just after 1 o'clock. CR 2220-755, State versus DeBell. Daybell, excuse me. Uh, we will continue forward. Uh, we're in the middle of the witness detected from a CO. The cross-examination of, of detective had just completed. We're to the redirect. Uh, we'll have detective from a CO come back to the witness stand. He's still under oath. Your Honor, the state has no further questions for Detective Hermosillo. Okay. Detective Hermosillo, you, you, uh, you don't need to come back up here then. Uh, next witness, Mr. Wood. Uh, the state calls Ron Ball. Detective Ball, if you'll stand here in front of the plexiglass at the witness stand and raise your right arm and face the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or the testimony you're about to give in this cause now having shoving the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help Yes. Detective Ball will have you sit right here at the witness stand. Once you've been seated, you can remove your mask. Detective Ball, if you'll pull that microphone uh, up and aim it up towards your chin. This one? Yep. Okay. Pull it down just a little bit. Uh, there you go. Mr. Woods, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, will you please state your name and spell it for the record? My name is Ron Ball, B-A-L-L. -L. Where are you currently employed? I'm currently employed at the Rexburg Police Department. How long have you been employed there? I've been employed there for a little over 28 years. What is your current title? My current title is I'm the lieutenant over investigations. Okay. Have you completed the post academy? I have. I hold a basic, intermediate, advanced, and a management certificate. Uh, also, I am a graduate from the FBI National Academy in 2015. Okay. Uh, Detective. Through your work at the Rexburg Police Department, were you involved in the investigation of the disappearance of J.J. Valley, J.J. Vallow and Tyree Ryan? Yes. Uh, Detective, were you present at Chad Daybell's residence on June 9th of 2019? I was. Okay. What were you there for? Uh, we were there to conduct a search warrant at that residence. Okay. Are you aware what, if anything, was discovered on his property? I am. What was it? The remains of two bodies. Okay. Do you know if uh, those remains were sent to the Ada, Ada County Coroner's Office? Yes. Um, how do you know that? I was personally involved in uh, uh, taking them to Ada County. Okay. Yeah, Ada County Coroner's Office. Okay. Um, what day did you take those to the coroner's office? We took the remains to the coroner's office on June 10th. Of what year? Of uh, this year. Okay, 2020? So yep. Uh, did you continue to work on this case on June 12th? Of Correct. 2020? What did you do that day? On that particular day, uh, myself, Detective Ray Hermosillo, uh, Detective Kakimanu from the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, and uh, Fremont County Coroner Brenda Dye went back to the Ada County Coroner's Office where we received and took in uh, evidence that was uh, uh, the state lab had or the coroner's office had retrieved from the bodies. Okay. Uh, were you involved in actually loading said evidence into the coroner's truck that day? Yes. Were you able to personally observe the evidence and or the packaging it was in? Yes. Uh, do you know who was in the coroner's truck? Uh, the driver of the vehicle of the coroner's truck was uh, Detective Kakimanu with Fremont County Sheriff's Office, and then uh, uh, Fremont County Coroner 
Brenda Dye was a passenger in the vehicle. Okay. And where were you during the transportation of the evidence? Myself and Detective Hermosillo were in another vehicle traveling with them. And did you ever lose sight of the coroner's truck? No. Did the coroner's truck ever stop prior to arriving at the state lab? Uh, it may have stopped at some traffic lights, but be, uh, that would have been the only stops. Okay. Once you arrived at the state lab, what did you do? Uh, once we arrived at the state lab, we met with uh, somebody outside, a representative from the state lab. We then took the property out of the back of the vehicle and then walked it inside the Idaho State Forensic Laboratory. Okay. Uh, so were you personally involved in moving the property from the coroner's truck to the state lab? Yes. Were you able then to view the evidence and or the packaging it was in? I did. Was it in the same condition it was in when you loaded it into the coroner's truck from the Ada County Coroner's Office? Yes. Do you know generally the evidence you were involved in transporting? Um, it was quite a bit of biological evidence. There was uh, some um, garbage bags, there was some duct tape. Um, quite a bit of it was biological. Same things. Okay. And when you say biological evidence, uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, swabs. Um, there were uh, uh, fingernail clippings, fingernail swabs, and those type of things. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Once the evidence was taken into the state lab, what, if anything, did you do? Once the evidence was placed in the state lab, um, or taken inside the state lab, I then went to a location with one of the uh, property management people there. That evidence hadn't been checked into the Rexburg Police Department yet because I had just received it and we were still in Boise. So I had to sit down. I had to get... Uh, my office on the phone. I talked to uh, Sergeant Colette Davison with the Rexburg Police Department. I went piece by piece of evidence and described to her what that piece was and she then entered it into the computer system back home or back in Rexburg and it was assigned a uh, number and then once that number, once I had that number I then gave that to the representative from the Idaho Forensic Laboratory and they then took custody of it. Okay. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibit 11. You've marked that, Mr. Wood? I have. Could we approach from it? You may. Uh, we're going to go back in chambers, though. I, I think because the plexiglass, it requires the attorneys to speak so loudly that it's really hard to keep it silent. So we'll, uh, we can go back in chambers, which is fine. All We'll be back on the record in State versus Daybell. The court took a brief recess to have a sidebar with counsel for the state and the defense. Uh, the issue has been resolved. It's my understanding. Mr. Wood, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd ask that um, State's Exhibit 11 be handed to the witness. Exhibit 11 will be handed to the witness. Mr. Pryor, you've had a chance to review that now. Is that correct? 
Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Any objection to the admission of Exhibit 11? Did he move for admission? He I did not. I have not moved yet. All right. I'll I think let I that... have to establish a couple things, Your Honor. That's fine. Uh, Detective, do you, do you have State's Exhibit 11 in your hand? Yes. Have you seen that document before? I have. And are you familiar with that document? I am. Uh, can you look on page two and tell me if that document is signed under penalty of perjury? It is. And does that, who does that document, uh, what organization does that document uh, purport to be from? This document is from the Idaho State Police Forensic Services. Your Honor, I'd, I'd move to admit State's Exhibit 11 into evidence uh, for purposes of identity. For purposes of identity, Judge, there's no objection. It will be admitted for purposes of identity. Your Honor, I'd ask that the defendant be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 12. Mr. Reed, did you say the penalty? Uh, we, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Exhibit 12 will be handed to the witness. Thank you. Uh, Detective, do you have Exhibit 5 in front of you? Or I apologize, Exhibit 12 in front of you? I do. Do you recognize that document? Yes. Have you had a chance to review it? Yes. Uh, what organization does that document purport this, to be from? This is from the Idaho State Police Forensic Services. Uh, can you look on page two of that document and tell me if it is uh, signed, under, signed under penalty of perjury? It is. Your Honor, the state would move for uh, State's Exhibit 12 to be entered into evidence pursuant to Rule 5.1 for purposes Pryor. of identity. For identification purposes, Judge, there's no objection. For identification purposes, it will be admitted. Exhibit 12. Your Honor, the state would ask that state's exhibit 13 be handed, be shown to the defense and then handed to the witness. <clears throat> exhibit 13 will be handed to the defense counsel. Exhibit 12 is being handed to the witness. Excuse me, Exhibit 13. Sure right, Detective, do you have State's Exhibit 13 in front of you? I do. Do you recognize that document? Yes. Have you seen it before? Yes. Who does that document report to be from? It is from the Idaho State Police Forensic Services. And uh, can you look on page 2 of that document and tell me if it's signed under penalty of perjury? Yes, it is. Your Honor, the state moves uh, that uh, State's Exhibit 13 be entered into evidence pursuant to Rule 5.1 for purposes of identity. No objection, Judge. Exhibit 13 will be admitted for purposes of identity. Thank you. The state has no further questions for Detective Paul. Cross-examination, Mr. Judge, Pryor. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. Uh, Lieutenant Paul, uh, the items that are referenced in the reports, the swabs and all of that, uh, initially, were those 
Thank you. Were those items uh, obtained by you? Did you did you do the swabs, or was that someone else? That was somebody else. And those folks provided you with the with the property. Is that correct? Correct. And can you just briefly describe how you were provided that property? Was it on site at Mr. Daybell's house, or where? Well, I guess I'm I'm not sure which part you're talking about. Was well, it at the lab or at the house? The swabs that were obtained. Okay. Okay, those were done where? They were done at the uh, Ada County Coroner's Office. Okay. Now, the other evidence that you made reference to that you transported to the, to the uh, uh, I believe, the lab for, or to the coroner's mm -hmm. to be trans with the folks from Fremont County, prior to that being transported, whose care and custody were those items in? Be the county coroner. Okay. So at some point, there was a transport from originally from where the items were obtained to the county coroner. Were you part and parcel of that uh, transport? I, I did not transport those items personally. So that was transported by uh, K Fremont County Coroner Brenda Dye and Detective Vince Kaikamanu. The last name again? Kaikamanu. <clears throat> And Mr. Wood, do you mind spelling kayak morning for the record so that uh, <laughs> we can all have that clear for right now? Does anybody know the spelling of that? Uh, I can guess, but I don't know that I can spell it correctly. Um, it's K A A I A K A M A W. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. May I? Proceed, Judge? You may. Thank you, Your Honor. So at some point from the site, we're going to call him Detective K. Okay. And the coroner obtained the items from the site and took them to the coroner's office. And at some point, you went from the coroner's office to the... Correct. Okay. And at all times, from the initial uh, obtaining those items, on what day did you obtain those items? We would have obtained them items on the 12th okay. of June. And then on the 12th, you took those directly to the... Uh, Idaho State Forensics Laboratory. Right, okay. And at no time did those items lose sight or did it... No. Uh, did you... Uh, all right. No further questions, Judge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Mr. Wood, any redirect? No, Your Honor. Thank you, Detective Ball. You can be excused from the witness stand. Mr. Wood, can this witness be excused from the court? Yes. No objection. Okay. The court's going to take just a moment for cleaning of the witness stand. Mr. Wood, you may call your next witness. State calls David Stubbs. Can I get Mr. Stubbs' title, please? Uh, detective. Thank you. Mr. Wood, is that uh, exhibit that's on the easel necessary for right now, or can we move that out of the way? You know, Your Honor, uh, we can move it out of the way. Great. Why don't we just set it up against the wall, facing the wall for right now, to give a little bit of room? Detective Stubbs, if you'll stand here in front of the plexiglass, raise your right arm and face the clerk. I do. Detective Stubbs, you can have a seat right here at the witness stand. 
Once you enter this cubicle, we'll allow you to remove your mask. Thank you. If you'll pull that microphone down a little bit and aim it up towards your chin, we're keeping a record. Mr. Wood, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Detective, can you state your name and spell it for the record? Uh, David Stubbs. Uh, last name S-T-U-B-B-S. Thank you. What is your occupation? Uh, I am a police uh, detective sergeant uh, with the detective division for the Rexford Police Department. Okay. How many uh, years have you been a detective? Uh, detective uh, since the year 2000. And how long have you been a police officer? Or how long have you worked for the Rexford Police? Approximately 25 years. And are you post certified? Uh, correct. All right. Um, do you hold any certificates of training in electronic forensics? Uh, I do. I'm certified as a operator and analyst in the Celebrite systems. Also, I have certificates in access data systems. I do have training in multiple uh, other uh, data systems as well. Uh, are you a part of the Idaho Crimes Against Children Unit? I am part of the uh, State of Idaho Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, yes. Thank you. How did you become involved in the investigation regarding the search for J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? I first became involved um, with Detective Hermosillo in reference to locating a vehicle that was in interest um, to Arizona police. Later, um, I became involved uh, after uh, a complaint was put in for a welfare check on juvenile uh, J.J. Ballow. Okay. Uh, have you ever met the defendant Chad Daybell? I uh, have. Okay. Uh, where did you meet him? Uh, I met him uh, when we uh, issued the search warrant for his property uh, in his kitchen. Okay. Have you ever met the defendant, Lori Vallow? I have. Judge, could I have some foundation on the date, time, and place? They gave us the place, but the date and time would be helpful. In That's, terms of I'll, I'll lay that foundation. Uh, what date, uh, you, you referenced a meeting defendant, Daybell. What date did you meet him? Uh, I don't recall the exact date. It was the date of the search warrant service. Uh, which search warrant are you referring to? The search warrant where we searched the property, the Daybell property. All right. Does June 9th sound like it might be that June date? June 9th would be correct. Of 2020? Um, and what time of the day did you meet him? Uh, we uh, knocked on the door and entered the uh, residence around 7 a.m. Okay. Have you met the defendant, Lori Vallow? I have. Uh, do you know the approximate date of when you met Lori Vallow? Uh, that would have been November 26th, 2019. Do you know approximately what time of day you met her? Uh, it was in the AM. Okay. Uh, where did you meet her? Uh, 565 Pioneer Road, apartment number 175. Was anyone else with you when you met her? Yes, I was accompanied by uh, Lieutenant Ron Ball and later uh, was joined by Sergeant Kellen Wetton. Okay. And what was the purpose of you meeting her that day? Uh, we were uh, trying to perform a welfare check of the welfare of J.J. Ballow. Okay. Uh, were you wearing a body camera that day? I was. Okay. And did your body camera record your meeting with Lori Vallow? Yes, it did. How many times did you speak with Lori Vallow that day? Uh, two different occasions that morning. Okay. Uh, and generally speaking, what did you ask her? Uh, our focus was to uh, inquire on the welfare or the location of J.J. Vallow and uh, make sure he was okay. okay.
Your Honor, we'd ask that uh, the witness that states Exhibit 14 be uh, shown to the defense and then handed to the witness. The bailiff will hand Exhibit 14 to the defense. The bailiff has handed Exhibit 14 to the defendant, or the, excuse me, the, the witness. Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibit 14? I do. Have you, uh, what is it? Uh, it is uh, the recordings from my body camera. Um, there's two different recordings on this from the 26th of Ooh. November, 2019. Okay. And have you reviewed the contents on I, that disc? I have. Are they true? Are the contents of that disc a true and accurate representation of, of what you saw that day? They are. And is it a true and accurate representation of, to the best of your knowledge, of what your body camera recorded? Yes. Your Honor, the state would ask that uh, State's Exhibit 14 be entered into evidence. Mr. Pryor? If I may inquire in aid of objection. You may. Can you give me an idea, officer, as to when you reviewed that for its accuracy on a date and time? Can you speak a little louder? Oh, I'm sorry. We you pulled out the microphone. What date and time did you review that to ensure that there was an accurate copy of what transpired uh, on your interview with Ms. Fallow? Uh, I, the last time I reviewed this was this morning. Okay. All right. No further questions, Judge. Thank you. All right. Any objection to the admission of Exhibit 14, Mr. No Pryor? No objection, Judge. Thank Exhibit you. 14 will be admitted. Your Honor, we'd ask that this be placed into the uh, DVD player. You wish to publish it right now? Yes, we wish that the state moves to publish it, Your Honor. All right. We'll have the bailiff or whoever's in charge of IT put that into the player. I'll remind the media that pursuant to my earlier ruling, I'm going to prohibit the photographs or the videotaping of the publishing of this video here in court. The court will be at ease for a moment while this uh, is loading. Mr. Wood, take all the time you need. Thank you. As soon as it pops up, we'll start it.
Your Honor, may I approach the... You may. Please uh, don your mask. Mr. Wood, do you need a brief recess so you can uh, troubleshoot the technology here? We may need to. We came in to test this the other day and it worked just fine. So we might need just a second, Your Honor. We'll be in recess for a moment. Judge, can Mr. Daybell, may Mr. Daybell and I be excused to go in the hall to discuss some matters? That's fine. Thank you, Your Honor. Please be seated. We'll be back on the record, continuing with the direct examination uh, of Lieutenant Ball. Is that correct? No. Excuse Stubbs. me. It's uh, Stubbs. Stubbs. I apologize. Yeah. Detective Stubbs. Mr. Wood, have you worked out your technology issues there? Yes. I want to thank uh, Josh, the IT guy, for taking care of that for us. He's very uh, competent. You may proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Detective, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start playing this and then pause it and have you tell us what's going on when you recognize what it is. my body cam footage as uh, myself and Lieutenant Ball uh, approach the apartment number 175 the first time on the 26th. Okay. Police Department, how are you? You got a minute? Yeah, sure. You all alone, or did that help? Or? Uh, my brother's here. Okay. This is Detective Stubbs. Hello. Nice to meet you. So, we're here. Wow, this is a big mess. I just talked to the guy on the phone. And what did he ask you? He was just saying that he wanted to do a well check on JJ. So, JJ would be where? He's in Arizona. Who, who's he with in Arizona? He's with one of my friends in Arizona. Oh. Hi. Oh. Hey. You got a notepad? No. Want me to get one? Uh, Please. no, no. Come here. It's, you mind if he comes in? No, come on. So, Sorry. Sorry. who's the friend he's with? My friend Melanie. Her Melanie. son has autism. Her name is Melanie Gibbs. I gave him all the information on the phone. Okay, so he can call? Yeah. Her? Uh, this part. Yeah. What is all this? We're, we're a little what concerned. Because, well, 
the officers we were here earlier yeah. were checking, and they got a bad vibe that, like, something was going on here because uh, nobody knew anything about a child. They weren't talking. It's because a What's lot of stuff has gone on. If you don't want to know, it's a lot of stuff. So. Well, that's why we're concerned because very, it just was kind of weird. It is very weird. I've had to move around a lot. One of my brothers is trying to kill me, not the brother that lives here, obviously. He's kind of my protector. <laughs> my other brother was in with my husband who was trying to kill me for my $2 million life insurance policy. No well, well, no. <laughs> so a lot of stuff has gone on in this last year. It's been a horrible year for us. I've had to move around. And so I was going to move back to Arizona, put my son back in the school there because I tried to put him in school here, public school at Kennedy. Okay. He went for two months. We tried it, but he had such a hard time. Now, the person who called is my sister-in-law, but she's his natural grandmother. He's adopted by us. Okay, so her son, who is a drug addict, okay. had a baby with a girl who's a drug addict, and they took him from, you know, CPS took him, okay. gave him to the grandmother. She came and got him, and then she wanted us to adopt him, which we did. And we loved by him. By us? Who we my about? husband and I, who died earlier this year okay he passed away since he so passed away she's been trying to fight me for him and being really horrible to me and that kind of stuff the so she's kind of the paternal friend okay thank you that makes sense? that's I'm what sorry. i mean <laughs> the paternal grandmother yes, he has autism and adhd he has he doesn't really talk to people like he's he's very special needs so i had him in a special needs school there she was trying to so what happened was my husband, who we were married for 15 years and had raised all these five kids together, switched his life insurance policy to her, right? To, <laughs> to his sister, okay. who got a million dollars when he died, and we got nothing for me to raise JJ, and all the kids got nothing, and everybody got nothing. She got a million dollars. So I knew she was going to try to sue me for him or. For JJ? Yeah, because she now has this million dollars, so she can hire people to help. Him and I have nothing. My but you have nothing, legal custody. He's my son. I adopted him. Right. When he was two years. We had him from the time he was eight months old till two years old. So she does nothing that wants to cause me trouble. So I don't tell people the truth about where we are and what we're doing because of those reasons. So I look like a suspect, but I am not a good person. I've raised all of my kids. I've done everything that I'm supposed to do in life. But everyone is causing me trouble right now. So we don't want to cause a lot of trouble. How long have you been here? We've only been here since September. Okay. We moved up here in September. My daughter to go to BYUI. Her Your mom, daughter goes to BYUI? Yeah. Does she live here? Mm-hmm. So we just, it's been a nightmare. But I'm going to go back to Arizona so I can put him back in the special needs school. He couldn't do the school here. It was too hard for him. He would scream and cry, take him to school. The principal would have to come out, try to drag him out of the car. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, it's too hard. But I just don't tell people where I am. I don't tell her where I am ever. Okay. And she doesn't have any legal rights to anything. Like, she's been horrible to me since my husband died. My understanding, she never called to, to try to get the child, you know, hey, I'm interested to get the child back, you know, but that. I know, but she sends me these emails with, like, the dates and, like, like she's putting up court stuff, you know, like, just documenting. I haven't heard from him in all this time. And so I've told her that he's fine. But she, See, and we hadn't heard any of that as far as. I'm just saying she's doing this as part of that, yeah. is my understanding. And our only concern in this whole thing yeah, is, that is, the, fine. is the child. I got it. And, and so that's, that's where we're at on the. Uh, so. And then so we I were just a little her. weirded out when, you know, and, and I understand now that we've heard your side of the story. It's awful. They just, the, I feel like I'm being trapped all the time. I'm like, why are police coming to my well, door? What's the idea? They said they were out visiting with two guys, and I'm assuming was, one's your brother. Yeah. Who was the other one? The other guy they were visiting with. There were two. Well, we had two detectives over here trying to. Looking for you oh. a little while ago. Oh, because I was at the store. And they ran into. Well, probably one of your brothers. In My the back brother here. and his friend, probably. Oh. Who's been that? Moving. Chad. Chad from around here? Mm -hmm. What's his last name? <laughs> Bill. Okay. All right. so, it's just a mess. It's just constantly 
Cousin Mutual Will. Chad the Chad the B A Y B E L L. He's an author. Doesn't he live like out in the? Isn't that the Chanty Bell that? Uh, did his wife pass away recently? Is that him? I I don't know. But it is Chanty. D a y b e l l. But it sounds familiar as an author. I think I, know, I think I know one of his. He's got a couple of daughters. Uh, he has lots of kids. Okay. I'll bet it's safe. All right. Well. Anything else? Sorry to bother you. Thank you. Yeah. We don't mean to be a problem. I'm sorry we that just... people are constantly knocking at my door, looking for me, and I just don't want to be found. So. Have you know. had problems? Because I think we've only had. My bro well, the reason I'm moving is because the brother that was going to kill me, that we found emails and texts with my ex husband, my husband at the time, came showing up here. So he found out where I was, and he was knocking on my door. No, this was your brother. One of my you showed up here and was knocking on your door. He lives in Kansas. And you said something about you were getting threatening emails? Well, no. Just after my husband passed, I found emails and texts between them that they were planning all this stuff to get rid of me. Do we need to worry about him coming over? Well, that's why I'm moving back. I'm well, moving, and I'm not going to be in a place. I'm going to live with my friend, Melanie. Don't tell anybody her name, Gib. Because I don't want anything in my name. I put the apartment in my name, but I've been staying over here with my brother because he protects me. Okay. He's very protective I just want of to know me. If so. he shows back up, you know, you can call. Come and take care of it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I just, like, it's just a nightmare. I mean, I canceled the insurance policy since my husband passed, so there's no money if they kill me. <laughs> and what are they going to do with JJ and Patty? Like, what do you people think? Okay. So. Well, <laughs> if you. Have a problem, so back up, feel free to call us. And we'll come and run him off or something. Okay? Yeah, All right. Okay, we'll get out of here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See ya. <clears throat> uh uh. Not. Not. Detective Stubbs, did you return to that same apartment that day? Yes. Uh, when uh, Detective Hermosillo and Detective Hope could not contact uh, Melanie Gibb, a few minutes later from this encounter, uh, we went back to her door uh, to inquire about how we could get a hold of Melanie Gibb. And is that what is on the second uh, film file here? That is Video correct. Okay. <clears throat> so if you want us to ask Lori if she would Friend. Wasn't Melanie the one living up here supposed to be that her daughter, Lori's daughter? No. This was the friend that she's going back down to live with, she said. Right. She's got a daughter named Melanie. I thought. Let's just see if she will call and have Melanie get a hold of Hope and just do a verification. because she, apparently she's not answering the phone down there. Well, they were going to Frozen 2 today, 
so they may be at the movies. Could you get a hold of her at some point and say, can you please call back the officer that's been trained to call you? Okay, sure. Yeah, because I think they are at the movies right now. Okay, that, that, he's been trying to call her or other officer. She's not answering. Okay. But if they're at the movie, that's... Probably at Frozen 2 right now. Yeah. Because that's the one thing he wanted to do. I'm Frozen 2. <laughs> yeah. Frozen 2 is so yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know if I can handle a whole winter here. That's probably why. Yeah. So if she'll just return his call, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Detective Stubbs, I asked you earlier about your, uh, do you have any certification, certifications regarding computer and cell phone forensics? Uh, have you been involved in any analysis of cell phone records related to this case? I have. Okay. Are you familiar with location records which can be found on electronic devices? I am. I, can you tell us, can you tell the court generally explain generally about location records that can be found on, on electronic devices? So it all will depend on the device itself, um, who the provider is that is uh, tracking location, web searches, uh, a number of different apps will, will track your, uh, what you're doing. Okay. Um, and do you know how those records are generated? Well, it just depends um, on the provider what kind of stuff that they are uh, searching for, what, what, what their target, if you will, their target market is. Um, it can be, uh, you know, your, what you searched for uh, so they can better uh, plan for, for that stuff or, or uh, uh, GPS data, latitude, longitude, dates and times that you do things. Okay. Um, have you used location information from a cellular device successfully in any other cases? I have. Okay. Um, have you analyzed any location records of electronic devices as part of your investigation in this case? Yes, I have. Detective, are you familiar with Alex Cox? I am familiar with him in this case, yes. Okay. And do you know who he is? Uh, I've, I've never met him, but I know he is the brother to Lori Ballow Daybell and the brother-in-law to the defendant, Chad Daybell. Okay. Um, do you know where Mr. Cox is now? Uh, I have been told that uh, Mr. Cox uh, died in Should December 2019. Mr. Pryor? Hearsay. Mr. Wood, there's been an objection as to hearsay. I'll rephrase the question. Okay. Uh, through your investigation, uh, do you know of, uh, of the death of Mr. Cox? Yes. Okay. Uh, through your, uh, pursuant to your investigation, why were you interested in Alex Cox's Google data? Uh, the reason we were interested was um, we knew Alex lived in an apartment very close to Lori. We also knew because of the relationship between uh, Lori and uh, Chad being, you know, brother-in-law and sister, that Alex may have some information on to where the location of the children may be. Okay. And were you, um, were you able to obtain Alex Cox's Google location data? Yes, we were. How did you do that? Uh, we issued a, a search warrant. We had information of uh, many known phone numbers, email addresses for the individuals uh, in this case. Uh, we obtained a search warrant that we issued to Google and received a return from them with results. Okay. And you may have already answered this. Did the warrant ask for just Alex Cox's data or multiple users? No, we were requesting multiple users from the information we had obtained. Okay. Mr. 
When you received a return on that warrant, was that, war was that return accompanied by a certificate of authenticity? Yes, it was. Your Honor, the state would ask for uh, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 15 to be shown to the defense and then handed to the witness. Exhibit 15 will be shown to Mr. Pryor. Exhibit 15 is now being shown to the witness. Uh, Detective, do you recognize that document? I do. What is it? It's a certificate of authenticity that was uh, accompanied the results of the search warrant from Google. And have you reviewed that document before? I have reviewed this document, yes. And are you familiar with its contents? I am. A detective, is that document signed under penalty of perjury? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, by whom? Uh, the Andrew Jordan. Okay. Uh, does that certificate of authenticity state that the record was made from information transmitted by someone with personal knowledge? Yes, in paragraph one it states that. Does that, does that certificate of authenticity state that the record was kept in the course of regular conducted activity of Google? In paragraph five, it states that as well. And does the certificate of authenticity state that the record was a regular, that making the record was a regular practice of Google? Also in paragraph five, it states that, yes. Okay. Your Honor, I would ask that that certificate, certificate uh, State's Exhibit 15, uh, be entered into evidence. No Mr. objection, Judge. Exhibit 15 will be admitted. Your Honor, I'd ask that what's been marked at State's Exhibit 16 be shown to the defense and then handed to the witness. <clears throat> Exhibit 16 is being handed to the witness. Detective, do you recognize that document? I do. Have you seen it before? I have. And have you reviewed it? I have reviewed this document, yes. And are you familiar with its contents? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with its contents? I am. Uh, Detective, when you sent your search warrant for uh, the accounts from Google that you talked about, uh, did the accounts provided by Google include Google subscribers? subscriber information yes that is what this document is in reference to okay and is this document a true and accurate representation of the uh, subscriber information you received for one of those google documents yes this is one that uh, that google sent us for one of those accounts yes your honor the state would ask that states exhibit 16 be entered into evidence no objection judge exhibit 16 will be admitted Uh, detective, 
Can you look at the, uh, the top of the first page of Exhibit 16? Okay. Um, and do you see where it says Google subscriber information? I do. Is there a name identified with that subscriber information? The name of Alex Cox. Is there an email associated with that subscriber information? There is. The email is Homer J. Maximus at gmail.com. Is there any other data on that subscriber information page? Uh, there is a subscriber phone number, which we had previously identified as belonging to Alex Cox. Okay. Sorry, I can't hear you. Detective, when you received the return on that search warrant, um, uh, what was the size of, of that document in terms of, of pages, if it were to be printed out? Oh, the size of this entire document was thousands of thousands of pages. Okay. Um, we've discussed Alex Cox's Google location data. Um, if that were to be printed out, do you know approximately how many pages it would be? So just the location data for this particular account, if you were to print it out, would have been over 28,000 pages. Okay. And if, if you were to open that data up on a, um, on a computer, what, what format is, does it come in? Uh, if you opened it up, you would see it in what would be like an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Um, and what kind of information is located on that spreadsheet in general for Google location data? So for Google, it would be uh, uh, the uh, date time stamps. Um, it would be the latitude and longitude of the uh, said, if you will, pings or pins that were placed. Uh, it would have um, a radius of air that Google has interpreted. Um, it would have uh, what, they have what they know as the device being used to access the Google system. And then there's another number that is really associated with Google and whatever inner workings they have that would have to be Google that explains it. Okay. Um, due to the large size of of the data, I think you said it was over 28,000 pages of user location data, correct? Correct. Have you prepared any summaries of data you found in that document? I have prepared some, uh, yes, yeah, some documents. Uh, can you tell us about those, those documents? So what I did was I took a, uh, an aerial photograph um, and that I took specific dates and times of interest and just uh, pinpointed on the map using GPS latitude, longitude, time date stamps uh, to place pins on a map to show location. Okay, and how many, uh, how many summaries have you prepared? I prepared two at this time. Okay. And were those summaries prepared with data you verified from Alex Cox's Homer J. Maximus account? Yes. And that is the same data that you received um, uh, included with that uh, certificate of authenticity. That is correct. We introduced earlier. Okay. Your Honor, the state would ask for state's exhibit, what's been marked as state's exhibit 17, to be shown to the defense and then handed to the witness. Do you want to hand it to the witness or put it on the easel, Mr. Wood? Uh, we, we can put it on the easel. 
we'll just put it over the top of the previous exhibit. Oh. Would you like that handed directly to the witness? Your Honor, I, uh, I actually would like to have the, uh, before I enter that into evidence, well, yeah, before I ask for that, uh, I'd ask for the State's Exhibit 17 to be entered into evidence. Okay. Mr. Pryor, any objection to that? I think a little more foundation would be uh, necessary. That's fine. H hold up here, Madam Bailiff. Sounds like Mr. Wood is going to lay some more foundation. Would you like that ex exhibit handed to the witness? Your Honor, I, yes, I'd be fine. Okay. Uh, Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibit 17? I do. I prepared this. Okay. Uh, what data did you use to prepare that with? Uh, the location data that I had obtained from the Google account, Homer J. Maximus. Okay. And uh, was that data verified with the Homer J. Maximus account? As far as verified that I have checked and double checked uh, my locations from the map overview to the uh, GPS or latitude longitude given by Google. Okay. And how did you prepare that? Um, well, there's a number of ways you can prepare it. Um, this particular uh, aerial photograph, um, we just did. Uh, you can do this using uh, Google Earth, Google Maps, Ping Maps, or Bing Maps, uh, Microsoft, anyone, if you enter a location um, with the GPS coordinates, um, doesn't matter from my experience, anyone that I've used will always come up with the same waypoints. Okay. You are this time I'd ask this. States Exhibit 17 uh, be entered into evidence. And I'd, I'd add that that's pursuant to rule, out of the rule of evidence 1006, which allows for summaries to be prepared of voluminous data. Mr. Pryor? Judge, I don't have a problem with how he's applying 501. The difficulty is he has a demonstrative exhibit that he's trying to mark without any foundation of what's on that in terms of the picture and what it represents. So there's still a foundation problem here. State's more than happy to lay that foundation, Your Honor. I'd like that laid out so that there's a clear record of exactly what uh, that picture that is in uh, Officer Stubbs' hands represents. So I, I need some more foundation in that regard, Judge. All right. Detective Mr. Stubbs. Woods, please, please oh. do so. Uh, the base layer of that, that uh, summary document you have, what, what, is, what does it purport to be? Uh, this overhead view is of the property uh, of 202 East, uh, 1900 North, uh, the Chad Daybell property. Okay. And have you been at that property? I have been at this property, yes. And have you, uh, have you are you familiar uh, with the layout of the property and landmarks on that property? I am. Okay. And is that... Uh, is that base layer, that image, is that a uh, true and accurate representation, to your knowledge, of, of what that property looks like? It is. Okay. Um, and then what layers have you added to that uh, summary? Uh, so besides the photograph itself, um, I have added a, if you will, uh, type of table of contents at the bottom where I can explain um, the other things that I put on here, which would be red triangles that are uh, specified by a number next to them that correlate with the latitude and longitude that I have placed on, on this map. Other than those things, that is the only thing I've added to this photograph. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, the state would move forward. There won't be an objection this time. Exhibit 17 will be admitted. Your Honor, before, I, before uh, 17 is published, the 
state would ask that what's in mark of state's exhibit 18 would be shown to the defense and then handed to the witness. Exhibit 18 will be handed to the witness. Uh, Detective, do you recognize State's Exhibit 18? I do. Is it one of the summaries that you were uh, you testified to earlier? Yes, this is a second summary. Um, did you prepare that summary with data you verified came from Alex Cox's Homer J. Max on his Google account? Yes, I did. Okay. What is the base layer of that image purport to be? Uh, the base layer of this uh, is the apartment complex at uh, 565 Pioneer Road, where both uh, Lori Vallow, Daybell, and Alex Cox resided. Judge, and I want to be clear that he's referring to Lori uh, Vallow and Alex Cox, and he did use the Daybell last name, but I want to make it clear that he's in no way implying that Chad Daybell was part of that. Is that correct? Living in that residence? As, as living here? As living in that residence that's in your hand right now. That's correct. Just so we have a clear record, Judge, because the Daybell name was used. The record will so reflect. Uh, how did you prepare that summary? Again, this was an aerial photograph taken um, I, there's been a, a couple layers added to this. Uh, this was, was uh, this image I, w I received from our GIS department, which is the department uh, of the city who maps, if you will, all of the city, uh, also their, uh, if you will, the boundaries of residents and so forth and so on with addresses and so forth. So the second layer shows uh, these apartments and the apartment numbers associated with the individual apartments. Again, my table of contents at the bottom right that uh, I received that data off of the Google uh, location services I had received from Google with the Homer J. Maximus account. Okay. Your Honor, the state would ask that uh, State's Exhibit 18 be entered into evidence. Judge, I would ask that there's an identifying factor telling me the date of that uh, summary because there's been no representation of the exact date that that summary represents, so I would like that from the witness. There's been an objection as to foundation with the summary. Mr. Wood, do you wish to lay that objection? I... The detective, what are the, um, what are the dates associated with the data you entered onto that, uh, that image? Uh, the reference numbers? Is that what we're referring to? The GPS coordinates I placed on here? Yes. Uh, they are uh, September 9th, uh, three of those on September 9th. Also, uh, September 14th and September 6th are all dates that I've associated on this map. You know, at this time, we'd ask that states do that 18 be entered in evidence. Judge, just clarification in lieu of objection, if I may. Mr. Pryor, if you'll speak up just a little bit, I'm having I'm sorry, difficulty. Just clarification, and that a, uh, if I can inquire in aid of objection, Judge, just very briefly. You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Officer, September 9th, you said there are three uh, uh, readings at that particular point. Is that correct? I have mapped three different. Right. Yes. And those represent just Alex Cox. Is that correct? Uh, not Alex Cox, but the device belonging to Alex Cox. Okay, and then on the 14th of September, it's the device belonging to Alex Cox as well. Is that correct? That is correct. And then on the 6th of September, it's the device belonging to Alex Cox. Is that correct? That is correct. And you, you already foresaw, you, you foresaw, excuse me, you already anticipated my question is that's merely just a device that in no way can establish whether or not the person is present at the time of those locations. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Nothing else, Judge. Thank you. 
Mr. Pryor, I feel like your questions were cross-examination questions. Any exhibit, any uh, objection to the admission of Exhibit 18? No, Judge. Exhibit 18 will be admitted. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd ask that uh, Exhibit 18 be published and be placed on the easel. Would you like that placed over the previous exhibit that's on the easel, Mr. Wood? Uh, yes, please. Or do you whatever want, is easiest for court personnel. Do you want both of those summaries to be uh, visible as you're questioning the witness? Uh, one at a time, Your Honor. We'll start with 18 and then go back to 17. Okay, why don't we take a brief recess right now. We're going to crank the air conditioner in this courtroom for just a moment, see if we can cool it down by 10 or 50 degrees. And uh, we'll go back on the record here in 15 minutes. It's 2.30, so why don't we plan on uh, going back on the record at about 10 minutes to 3 o'clock. Thank you, Judge. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. We'll be back on the record. Court took a brief recess to cool it down in here. Uh, we were in the middle of direct examination of Detective Stubbs. And uh, Mr. Wood, I think you had just uh, admitted 17 and 18 into evidence. It looks like you have 18 on the easel right now. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You may proceed with your direct examination. Your Honor, I wonder if I could adjust that so that I can see um, the easel as well. That's fine. Do you need to scoot it back towards the wall? I think so. I can. Your Honor, due to the uh, nature of what uh, Detective Stubbs is going to be testifying to, we'd ask that he be able to uh, stand next to the easel and, and put on a mask. That's fine. Mr. Wood, why don't you don yours while he does that? Yep. There's a laser pointer as well, Mr. Wood. I don't know if you've explained that to Detective Stubbs. Okay. Um, hold up here. Do we, uh, if he's going to be touching the exhibit, why don't we put some gloves on the, the witness here, if there's going to be anybody else that's touching it. There's some right here. Fine. All right. Uh, 
detected now that uh, Exhibit 18 has been published. Can you, and since we took a, a break, can you just briefly summarize again uh, what Exhibit 18 is and how you prepared it? So this was an aerial photograph taken uh, of this apartment complex, uh, April 2000 is when the photograph was taken. Uh, what we did was we, we took, if you will, we made this table of contents here, which uh, I numbered one, two, three, eight, and nine. Um, those numbers correlate with the red triangles that I have placed on this map in two different locations and represent from the Google documents the location services for the Homer J. Maximus account. These latitude and longitudes correlate with these triangles. Now, also accompanied on this map, along with those records up from the Excel spreadsheet, as I mentioned, 28,000 plus pages. The number here and the reference number on the far left column of that Excel spreadsheet is the quick reference one, two, three, four, and so on, on down the page. This number correlates with that line item, if you will. Next are the coordinates that Google provided for us. Next to that is the date and time that these locations were logged through Google on that account. And the very last line over here is margin or radius of error from these findings from Google. Okay. And are all the margins of error the same? No. Um, depending, depending on the one, um, they range, uh, as you can see here, if you can see from four meters uh, and a couple at 15 meter radius of air. Okay. Uh, on exhibit 18, why did you focus on the coordinates you focused on? Uh, mainly because of, of, of two things. These are two residents um, where Alex Cox resided in 107, and that uh, Lori Bell, Dave Bell, resided in 175. Okay. Uh, was there anything significant about the dates? Uh, as far as the dates go, 1, 2, and 3 are dated the 9th of September, 2019 in the early morning hours of that day. Um, what is the time stamp on, can you, can you point to uh, pin number three? Here in the parking lot. And what is the time stamp on that? Number three is 0 to 42 hours and two seconds. Okay, and what was the date on that? That was the September 9th, okay. 2019. And uh, can you point to pin number two? Pin number two is almost in the same location in the parking lot. And uh, what is the time on, what is the time stamp on that? Uh, pin number two is 0242 and 11 seconds. Okay. And can you point at pin number one? Uh, same location. At this triangle here. Okay. And what is the time stamp on that? That would be uh, 0, 03322. Okay. Um, what is the margin of error on pin number three? Pin number three is at four meters. What is the margin Judge, of error? Judge, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to interrupt. He said four meters or 40? Four. 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 Thank you. What is the margin of error on pin number two? Four meters. And what is the margin of error on pin number one? Four meters. Okay. Now, let's talk really quickly about the timestamp. When you receive Google records, 
Are they in mountain time? No. What is, how is the time delayed on the Google location data? So on the Excel spreadsheet, they would be in UTC time. Okay. UTC here during that time of year is uh, UTC minus six hours. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you point at pin number eight? Actually, I'm gonna ask you to point to pin number nine first. Pin number nine is over in this area here. Okay. Uh, what is the timestamp on pin number nine? Pin number nine is, would be September 6, 2019 at 2.56 a.m. and 13 seconds. Okay, and what's the, the margin of error or radius of error on that? Uh, 15 meters. Okay. And can you give us the same information on pin number eight? Pin number eight uh, is the 14th of September, 2019 at 01, 21, and 43 seconds in the a.m. And what is the margin or radius of error on pin number eight? That again is 15 meters. Uh, Your Honor, I'd ask to publish uh, State's Exhibit 17 at this time. No objection. Is that correct, Mr. Wood? Yes. And again, just uh, to clarify for the record, due to taking a break, can you just briefly summarize again what uh, State's Exhibit 17 is? This is an aerial photograph of the Chad Daybell property. Okay, and where is that located? Uh, 202 East 1900 South okay. in Fremont County. And did you prepare that? that summary in the same manner as State's Exhibit 18? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, how many uh, data points have you plotted on that, on that summary? Four data points. Okay. Can you um, point uh, to data point or location number five? Location number five is in this area here. Okay. Um, what is the timestamp on that? Timestamp of September 9th, 2019 at 9.21 and 36 seconds in the AM. Okay, what's the margin of error on that? Uh, that would be six meters. Uh, can you point to location number four? This area here? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the timestamp on that? Timestamp of September 9th, 2019 at 1057 and 03 seconds in the AM. And what's the margin of error? Five meters. Okay. Uh, Detective, can you point at location seven on that summary? Here? Yes. Uh, what is the timestamp on location seven? Timestamp of zero nine fifty six and twenty eight seconds in the a.m. Okay. And what's the margin of error on that? Four meters. And finally, can you point to location number six? Number six is in the same area, general area. And uh, what is the timestamp on that? Uh, 923 2019 at 10 02 19 hours in the a.m. And what's the margin of error? Three meters. Okay. Thank you. Detective, I can take your seat again. Detective, when you've been seated, you can take off your glove and mask if you'd like. Detective, you, you testify, testified about the contents of the Homer J. Maximus uh, Google location data. 
Are there other data points located on the Daybell property in that uh, in the data that was given to you on your search warrant return? There are additional data points in the area, yes. Um, and are there additional data points near or on the uh, near the Rory Vallow apartment uh, at 565 Pioneer Road? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a reason you didn't uh, map out all the data points on the Homer J. Maximus Google location data? Uh, well, the reason being is because the file is so massive that it would take, uh, I can't even imagine how long it would take to uh, put all the waypoints on a map. Okay. Uh, Say so has no further questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Cross-examination, Mr. Pryor. Thank you, Judge. Initially, when you went out there for the uh, interview of Ms. Uh, Vallow, and I believe that was in November, is that right? That is correct. And the date in November was what, officer? The 26th. Okay. Now, the purpose of that initial visit was a welfare uh, check, was it not? It was. Okay, so it was a preliminary matter, is that correct? Yes. And you're a detective with which law enforcement agency? The Rexburg Police Department. And as the Rexburg Police Department, is it your policy that even for preliminary matters, such as a welfare check, you are required to have your body cam on? It is not a requirement. However, um, since I've been issued a, wire, a, a body camera, um, I always make it a practice to wear it when I go to talk to people outside the office. And that is because you want to accurately and uh, correctly reflect what someone says to you. Wouldn't that be the case? That's right. And you want to accurately provide a record of what was transpired because people make mistakes, correct? Yes, people can make mistakes. And, and well, police officers are obviously people as well, and police officers make mistakes when they're, when they're in the uh, course of doing an investigation. There are times when uh, they may not recite things exactly the way they are. So. A camera is a tool to help you do that. Is that correct? Your Honor, I'm going to object. I think that's more testimony than it is a question. Mr. Pryor, what's your question? The, the question is, is that it's a good practice to have a body cam and, a, and record a conversation when you're interviewing any witness, correct? That is my, my personal feeling for me. And you're doing that out of experience, correct? Correct. Now, there was some previous testimony about um, Mr. Cox residing in Unit 175. Do you have any information that suggests he was residing in Unit 175? Uh, I, don't have, I don't have that knowledge whether he was or, or wasn't residing, other than my body cam footage saying that he was there. Okay. And during the time that you went there on the 26th of November, Mr. Daybell wasn't there, correct? Uh, that day I never saw for myself Mr. Daybell. And there was an acknowledgement that her brother was there though, correct? That is correct. And then on the second trip, I don't recall seeing whether there was an acknowledgement that Mr. Cox was there. Uh, was he there again the second time, do you recall? I do not know. Okay. All right. Uh, but again, you didn't see Mr. Daybell there, correct? That is correct. And your inclin your your belief is that when you went to Unit 175, it was because you believed that was Lori Vallow's residence. Is that right? That is right. Okay. And your data points seem to suggest that you're looking at Unit 175 and Unit 107. Correct. And there's a reason for that, is there not? Yes. Uh, that's because somebody, else, somebody lives in Unit 107, right? We believe one of the family members lived in 107. And who would that be? Uh, Alex Cox. And who lives in 175? Lori Vallow. just so we put this into terms that uh, I can understand, uh, when you're talking about four meters, you're talking approximately 12 feet. Approximately. And when you're talking about 15 meters, you're talking about 45 feet. Approximately. Okay. Uh, 
I am curious, um, and this is in the way of an explanation. When you're talking uh, UC time minus six, give me an example of what UC time minus six is. It looks like the clock says 305. So what would, what would be an example of that? Well, if you will, um, there's a point where uh, they actually start recording time. And as you go through time zones, you gain or lose whatever an hour from the starting point of, if you will, a time starting. Okay, and so then because we're in mountain time, right. at that time of year, you take uh, the general time and you subtract six hours from that. So when you say 242 in pin number two um, on the in this example and it's 242, do we go back six hours earlier? No, you would you would add six. From UTC time, you minus six to so get to I our time. Ask, if I could ask you to go back up to the exhibit, would you mind doing that for me? Mr. Pryor, Exhibit 17 or Exhibit 18? Well, I'm going to start with 17, then we'll go to 18 after that. Because I think 17 is still up there, is it not, Officer? Uh, actually, All right, so that one is number... This eight. is 17. That's right. I'm sorry, maybe I misspoke. So let's talk with pin number 5. And pin number 5, you said it was on September 9th, correct? And you put down the time as uh, 9.21 a.m. Is that correct, officer? Yes, sir. All right. And then you put down the, the uh, time of um, variance or, or uh, uh, margin of error, I guess is the appropriate term, if I, based on what I've read, the margin of error is six meters, right? Correct. So is that actually 9.21 a.m. on September 9th, or is there a additional time that needs to be added to that? It was, in our time, 9.21. OK. However. When you talk to a carrier of a phone or or Google or whoever else, they generally send you this layout in UTC time. So depending on if you're on the East Coast, if you're here, wherever you are, you can do that margin and deduct those hours we're at. So you're the one who came up with the calculation as to what these proximate times are, is that correct? The only thing I did was minus UTC time minus six to get our local time. Okay, okay, all right. And then again, on, on number seven, pin number seven, what was the time on that one? Zero nine fifty six and 28 seconds in the AM. And those points that you're talking about reflect a device that was owned by Alex Cox, is that correct? That Google stays or belong to Alex Cox. Okay. And on the items that were set on uh, the house, or, or excuse me, the um, the apartments, uh, those were those times and those pins were a reflection of a device that was owned by Alex Cox. Is that correct? The same device. Okay. All right. Thank you, Officer. Go ahead. You can return to your seat. Can you tell me what the range of summaries is in this particular case? In other words, uh, the start time for which range you, you subpoenaed Google and the end time for which range you, you, you ended. And you're reflecting about 28,000 pages of documents. I'd like to know what the range is, the start range and the stop range. You know, I would have to actually look at the search warrant again to be sure of the dates we requested. Well, my recollection is that we admitted that, did we not, as exhibit? Uh, Search warrant 2019-86. Okay. Do you have a do you have a at least a recollection of what it may be? Uh, from what I remember, and I, uh, first part of September. Okay. Through December. Through December. Through when we served the search warrant. Okay. All right. So we don't know. How many times from September through December that those devices were on the Daybell property then, correct? Uh, we don't have a total number at this time, no. Are you working on that? 
Uh, there is uh, things being worked on at this time, Are yes. Are you working on that? Uh, I am working with members of the FBI cast team to come up with those numbers. Okay, so in other words, we're going to continue, at some point in the future, there will be a complete analysis of every date that this particular device or devices was not only in the apartment, but also on the Daybell property. That will be forthcoming, I can assume that, correct? Well, I can't answer for exactly what the cast team is doing, um, but they are doing additional analysis on those times and those coordinates. Okay. And that information has been preserved in the event uh, um, there needs to be a, uh, uh, someone else taking a look at that as well, correct? That is correct. Did you have an occasion to talk with Mr. Daybell at any time? I, I, sorry, I can't hear you. Did you have an occasion to talk to Mr. Daybell at any time? Uh, no. You hesitated. Why is that? Uh, I, I was trying to remember if I had said stand right over here or whatever while he was in the kitchen. I don't exactly recall. Okay, so there's no recorded conversation or body cam of Mr. Daybell that you have in your uh, possession. Is that correct? I did have my body camera on that day as well. Okay. Have I reviewed that as of the last little bit? I have not. Have you provided that to the prosecuting attorney? Uh, I believe he has copies. Okay. All right. Judge, I have nothing else at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wood, any redirect? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you, Detective Stubbs. You can be excused from the witness stand. Uh, this exhibit? Th that exhibit, uh, which number exhibit is that? 16. 16, thank you. Are there any other exhibits there in the witness cubicle? Okay. We'll allow uh, cleaning to take place of the witness cubicle. Mr. Wood, who do you intend on calling as your next witness? Your Honor, Spencer Ramble for the state. The state would next call Wynn Hill. Say that one more time. Wynn Hill. Wynn Hill? Yes, Judge. Mr. Wood, can I have the bailiff put that uh, exhibit back backwards again? Uh, yes. You can leave that on there, Mr. Bailiff, if you just want to turn it around backwards and set it against the wall. Mr. Hill, if you'll come forward, stand in front of this witness chair, raise your right arm and face the clerk. Stand right there in front of the plexiglass and look at the clerk right here. Raise your right arm. You can be seated here in the witness chair, Mr. Hill. Once you're seated, Mr. Hill, you may take off your mask. Mr. Wood, you may inquire. Thank you, Judge. And again, oh, Spencer Rammel for the record. Mr. Rammel, I apologize. You may inquire. Thank you, Judge. Can I have you state your full name and spell that name for the record? Please? My name is Wynn Hill, W-Y-N-N-H-I-L-L. -L. Mr. Hill, where are you employed? At Brigham Young University, Idaho. And how long have you been employed at BYU, Idaho? Yeah, just over 14 years. And what is your current role at the university? Yeah, I currently serve as the Dean of Students there. Does BYU-Idaho use a student management system? We do. Are you familiar with that system? I am. How so? Yeah, I have. A, I work in the student life area, and so we have a student life management system that connects to the larger student management system. 
Mr. Hill, will you scoot a little closer to the microphone? Sure. Pull that microphone down a little bit and aim it right at your chin. There we go. And then up at your mouth, that's great. Great. What information does your student management system hold? Yeah, it holds information from the um, application process uh, and other um, student enrollment uh, information on a student. Does your system allow you to look up current students attending BYU right now? Yes. Does your system allow you to look up past students? Yes. That have attended BYU right now, I'm sorry. Yes. Does your system allow you to look up individuals who have applied but are not currently attending BYU Yes, it does. Did you check your registration system for a specific individual in request of Rexford Police Department in relation, in relation, excuse me, to a missing persons investigation? I did. Who was that individual you checked for? Um, I believe they gave me the name of uh, Tylee Ryan, Tylee Cox, uh, Tylee Vallow. I checked all of those names with the date of birth of 92402. And can you tell me the date that you did that? I can. It was February 28th of uh, 2020. Me? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me uh, where you were when you checked it? I believe I was in my office. On campus? On campus, yes. And what was the result of that check? Yeah, we couldn't find any information on that person. So it's your testimony that names Tylee Ryan, Tylee Cox, and Tylee Vallow with the corresponding date of birth, September 24th, 2002, has never applied to BYU-Idaho or has never been a student at BYU-Idaho. According to our records. Judge, right. that's all I have. No questions, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. You can be excused from the witness stand. Mr. Rammel, may this witness be excused from the court? From the state perspective, yes. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Hill, for appearing. Mr. Rammel, uh, you can call the next witness as well. Your Honor, uh, I'll take care of the next witness. Uh, the state calls Melanie Gibb.
We'll be back on the record in State v. Daybell. Uh, the court took a brief recess to try and cool it down in here. Mr. Wood, is your witness ready? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Gibb, if you'll please come forward. You can come here through the gate on this side. Ms. Gibb, if you'll stand here in front of this plexiglass, raise your right arm and face the clerk. Ms. Gibb, I didn't hear you. Yes. Okay. Ms. Gibb, you can uh, be seated here at this witness chair. Ms. Gibb, if you'll scoot up to that microphone and then uh, pull it down below your chin and aim it at your chin. Mr. Wood and Mr. Pryor, I think the record isn't uh, picking up your voices as well as it is everybody else's, so if you'll do the same, pull that down and then point it up at your chin, it makes a much better record. If you'll pull it down, Mr. Pryor, and then point it up, kind of like this, so that you don't talk over it. Mr. Wood, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, will you state your name and spell it for the record? Melanie Gibb, G-I-B-B. -B. Okay. Um, Ms. Gibb, are you familiar with the defendant, Chad Daybell? Yes. Uh, approximately when did you meet him? About three, four years ago. Okay. Uh, do you remember where you met him? Yes. I was in Morgan, Utah. Okay. Um, since you've met him, uh, what is the nature of your relationship? Um, the nature of our relationship um, was talking about some of the books that Chad had written and um, his relationship with Lori. Uh, you mentioned Lori. Is that uh, Lori Vallow? Correct. Okay. Uh, approximately when did you meet Lori Vallow? October 2018. Uh, and do you remember, do you call, recall where you met her? Yes, in Mesa, Arizona at a church. Okay. Uh, what was the basis of your relationship with Lori Vallow? Um, it was based upon things that we talked about, which were spiritual in nature. Uh, would you call yourself, uh, were you friends with Lori Vallow? Yes. Okay. 
Are you familiar, or do you know if Lori Vallow had any children? Yes. Are you familiar with Tylee Ryan? Yes. Did you ever meet Tylee Ryan? Yes. Um, uh, and did you ever have opportunity to see Tylee Ryan with Lori Vallow? Yes. Okay. And was Tylee Ryan Lori Vallow's daughter? Yes. Uh, Ms. Gibb, when was the last time you saw Tylee Ryan? July or August of 2019. Uh, where was that? In her house in Chandler, Arizona. Okay. Are you familiar with J.J. Vallow? Yes. Who is J.J. Vallow? Lori's adopted son. Okay. Um, when you spent time with Lori, did you uh, have occasion to uh, spend time with J.J. at all? Yes. Okay. Ms. Gibb, I want to call your attention to, well, do you recall where you were uh, between the dates of September 19th, 2019, and September 23rd, 2019? Yes. Where were you? Rexburg, Idaho. Why were you there? I was there to visit Lori. I was also there to be at an event called Firm Foundation. Okay. Uh, when did you... Do you recall when you arrived in Rexburg? Thursday the 19th. And do you know approximately when you left Rexburg? Yes, I left Monday the 23rd around 9.30 in the morning. When you were in Rexburg, uh, where did you stay? In Lori Ballow's house. Do you recall the address of that house? No. Uh, uh, do you recall the general location of that house? It was a townhome. I, I don't know the name of the street. Okay. Uh, was that townhome located in Rexburg, Idaho? Yes. Yeah. Uh, during that weekend, um, did you have uh, opportunity to spend, to spend time with Lori? Yes. Okay. Uh, about how much time did you spend with Lori that weekend? Um, most of the time, except for on Saturday, I spent most of the day, about 10 hours, um, up the street at that event. Okay. Um, when you were at Lori Vallow's house, did you ever have occasion to see Chad Daybell there? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall approximately how many times you saw him there that weekend? Two, three, four times maybe. Okay, so you don't recall an exact number? Not an exact number, but okay. I think every day. I think every day is pro, except for the Monday. Okay, and it was Monday, September 23rd? Yes. Okay. Did you have occasion to witness uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell interact with each other? Yes. Uh, how did they interact with each other? Affectionately. Okay, and when you say affectionately, uh, what do you mean by that? Um, holding hands, um, hugging, light kissing. Okay. Did you ever have occasion to speak with, uh, when you were, during this uh, four, approximately four day period in September, did you ever have occasion to speak with Lori Vallow about the, uh, the nature of her relationship with Chad Daybell? Yes, we, we talked about it often. Okay. Uh, what did she tell you about that relationship? Um, that they were very much in love with each other and wanted to be together as soon as possible. Okay, and did you ever speak with uh, Mr. Daybell about that relationship? Most likely, but I can't recall the exact words. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gibb, during that September 19th to 23rd, 2019 period, did you ever see Tylee Ryan? No. Did you speak with Lori Vallow about the location of Tylee Ryan? She informed me that Tylee was at BYU Idaho and mentioned something about being with friends. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Uh, when you were during that same period, did you have occasion to uh, see J.J. Vallow? Yes. Uh, where was he located when you saw him? He was in the family room, mostly, and then outside some. Okay, when you say the family room, uh, can you be more specific? The room that's adjacent to the kitchen. Okay, and uh, what home was that located in? Lori Vallow's home. Okay. Ms. Gibb, I want to call your attention to the night of September 22nd, 2019. Uh, do you recall what you did that night? Ms. Gibb, um, you're, you're facing the, uh, the state. I'm going to invite you to turn your chair just a little bit so that I this can way? see you. Oh, this way? This way, so that I can see your face as you're speaking. I recognize you're answering Mr. Wood's questions, but I need to see your face as well as you're answering. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what did you do the night of September 22nd, 2019? The night of 20, uh, the 22nd, I was um, doing a recording with Lori and David Warwick, and we were in the kitchen uh, recording that. Who is David Warwick? He is a boyfriend of mine. Okay. Um, and you said you were recording a podcast? Yes. Okay. Was Mr. Daybell there during the recording of that podcast? No. Okay. Uh, do you recall if J.J. Ballow was there during the recording of that podcast? I did not see him. Okay. Um, did you see Alex Cox that night? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, what did you witness or what did you observe Alex Cox doing that night? He brought J.J. into the house um, during the middle of the podcast. Okay. And... And did you see him bring J.J. into the house? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, was J. Uh, how did Alex Cox bring J.J. into the house? He carried him in, okay. and he was asleep. And Judge, this may have occurred, but I'm trying to get a foundation as to the time again. I may have missed it, and I, and I apologize if I missed it. Mr. Pryor, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Do you mind pulling your microphone down and then aiming it up at your chin? So there you go. Repeat that one more time. Judge, I missed the, um, the time, and I, I can't recall which time she said if she did, uh, when um, uh, that occurred with Alex bringing the baby in. I don't recall. All right. Time. I'll, I'll, I'll label a foundation, Your Honor. I didn't know if you did or not. I, 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 may, I thought I may have missed it. Please do. Um, Ms. Gibb, Ms. Gibb do, you, do you recall about what time Alex Cox brought J.J. back into the to Lori Dallas' home? I can say we recorded the podcast between 9 and after midnight, a little after midnight, so someone in between that time. Okay. You don't remember the exact hour? I don't. Okay. Um, I'm going to call your attention to the morning of September 23rd, 2019. Uh, what did you do during the morning of September 23rd, 2019? Upon awakening, I got ready for the day and came downstairs, had a brief conversation with Lori Fallow, and then got into the truck with David, and we drove off to Pocatello. Okay. Um, what was your conversation? Do you recall the content of your conversation with Lori Fallow that morning? Yes. Uh, and do you recall approximately what time you had these, this conversation with Lori Fallow? Sometime between eight and nine. Okay. Uh, what did you speak about with Ms. Vallow that morning? She shared with David and I that uh, JJ was acting um, with a lot of energy and um, I'm, try I'm trying to remember the words, but she recalled um, him climbing upon the refrigerator knocking a picture down of Jesus, she said, and then climbing up upon the cabinets. Okay. And did you see J.J. that morning? No. Okay. Uh, do you know if he was in the house that morning? No. Okay. And do you, do you have any, uh, any idea of where he was that morning? No. Okay. 
over the course of that weekend, uh, did you ever have a conversation with Lori Vallow about Kay Woodcock? Yes. Uh, what was the nature of that? Uh, do you remember when, during that weekend, you had that conversation? Friday, Saturday, it could have been okay. several of the days, I'm not sure. Uh, what, was the, what was the nature of that conversation? She was expressing that she wanted um, JJ to go live with Kay, and she, can, she expressed um, different solutions. Um, he could either stay with Kay or I believe a son of Kay's that had a family already that JJ was comfortable with, and, or that they liked JJ and it was a good match. I think they had a little girl, and she said that she would express to Kay that he was um, that she was sick or something was wrong with her so that she could um, uh, live with him. So, uh, so that who could live with JJ could live with Kay. Okay. And at any time after that weekend, did you ever have a follow up conversation in regards to that uh, to that subject? Yes. Uh, do you remember approximately when you had that follow-up conversation? It was shortly after. I can't recall. Okay. Uh, what was the, the nature of that follow-up conversation? I asked how it went, giving JJ to Kay. She told me that they met up in an airport, and she told Kay that she had breast cancer and that she would need help with JJ for a period of time, and she said it went well. Okay. Uh, so was it your understanding? after that conversation, that J.J. Vallow was located with Kay Woodcock? Yes. And had you ever met Kay Woodcock? Briefly. When? Um, the time that Charles Vallow was moving out of his house in Arizona to Louis, um, Texas. And who was Charles Vallow? Uh, Lori's husband. Okay. Ms. Gibb, I'm going to call your attention to the date of November 26, 2019. Uh, do you recall uh, where you were, where you were on November 26, 2019? I do. Where were you? I was in Pleasant Grove, Utah, in David Warwick's home. Okay. Now, do you live in? Do you live in Utah? No. Where do you normally live? Gilbert, Arizona. Okay. And so were you visiting Mr. Warwick that day? Yes. Okay. Um, did anything significant happen uh, that day in regards to Chad Daybell? Yes. Okay. Uh, what contact, if any, did you have with Mr. Daybell that day? I received a phone call from Chad Daybell, from his cell phone, to my cell phone, and um, I answered the phone call. Okay, and do you recall approximately what time it was? Late morning. Okay. And you, you said you got a call from his cell phone? Mm-hmm. How do you know it was his cell phone? Because it, when the phone number came up, it had his name on it. Okay, and was that a contact you had previously stored in your cell phone? Yes. Okay. And was Ms. Gibb, had you previously had any discussions with Mr. Daybell through that same phone number? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall what that phone number was? Yes, it was 208-690-9374. Okay. Um, and I may have already asked this, I apologize. If I did, approximately what time did you, were you called by Mr. Daybell that day? Late, late morning. Okay. What was the nature of that conversation? He said, hi, Melanie, this is Chad. Um, the Rexburg police are going to call you. Don't pick up. He okay. said, oh. Okay. Uh, where did the conversation go from there? 
he um, he let me know that the police were over at Lori Vallow's home in Rexburg, and that um, they were inquiring about where JJ was, and that she was going to tell the police that JJ was with me. Okay, how did you respond? In shock, and I can't recall if I said anything at that moment. Oh, I did say, after the shock, I said, JJ's not at Kay's house. And how did Mr. Daybell respond to that? He said no. Okay. Uh, did you, uh, was there any other content to that conversation? I asked him if he was nervous, and he said yes. Okay. Was anything else said? I can't recall. That same day, November 26, 2019, did you have any contact with Lori Vallow? Yes. Okay. Do you remember approximately where you were when you heard from defendant from Lori Vallow? Yes, I was in the same place. Where, and, okay. And where was that again? That was in uh, Utah, in David's home. And approximately... What time did you hear from Defendant Vallow, Lori Vallow? I possibly within an hour or two. I can't exactly recall. Okay. And when you say an hour or two, what what is that in reference to? Her calling me, Lori calling me. Right. Was it an hour or two after after what? After, I'm sorry, J Chad's phone call. Okay. Um, what was the nature of that conversation? Uh, when I picked up, she said, hi, Melanie, this is, you know, well, she probably didn't say her name, but she said, just want to let you know everything's fine. She was upbeat, cheery, acting like nothing was wrong. Uh, where did, what happened after that? Um, she told me that the police had been there asking for JJ and that she told the police that I had JJ that I was at a movie called Frozen, that she asked me just to pick up my phone and take a picture, a random picture of kids running around, um, and that she would come by and pick him up and then, no, I'm sorry, that after me driving home from Utah to Arizona, that she would come and get him later that week. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you right there, okay. Skip. Uh, I want to point you, you back to this conversation or the statement about uh, picking up your phone. Mm -hmm. What did she ask you to do with that again? Take, take a picture of random kids to make it look like it was JJ. Okay. Um, and, and I kind of lost track. I apologize. That's you, okay. You said something about driving down to Arizona. What was, what was, that part of the conversation, who said what? So she knew that I was going down to Arizona for Thanksgiving, back to my home. And she said that she told the police that she was going to pick him up from my house from Arizona, which I had no previous knowledge to this. This was new information to me. Okay. Um, did Lori say anything else to you about JJ? Um, I can't recall exactly, but I can recall what she talked about, about Kay. Okay, did, okay, what did she say about Kay? She said that, um, Kay was trying to kidnap JJ. And I said, how do you know? And she, she said, well, I've received emails, you know, being threatened that, that, was, um, that he was gonna kid kidnap her. I said, well, what, what does she say? And she said, well, she sent me emails and she said, she quoted Kay saying, it's not like I'm gonna kidnap him or anything. And that she was, um, that she was trying to protect JJ and 
from her and other people, not just Kay, but possibly family members as well. Okay. And you said that, to your perception, she seemed upbeat and positive. Were yeah. those the words you used? Yes. Okay. Um, to your perception, when you spoke with Mr. Daybell that day, uh, how did he sound? Very nervous. Is that why you asked him if he was nervous? Uh huh. Okay. Um, after receiving these phone calls, uh, how did it make? How did that make you feel? Um, horrible. I felt um, in shock. I was um, not okay with it because she told something to the police that was not true, which I had no knowledge of. So I was. Um, I had a really bad feeling in my stomach, and I felt very shaken up by it. Okay. Do you know if the Rexburg police attempted to contact you that day? They did. Okay. Uh, how did they try to contact you? They tried calling me, and once I believe they left a text. Okay. And did you respond to them that day? Not the Rexburg police. I did not. Okay. How, how come? Is there a reason? Well, first of all, Chad tells me not to answer it and then Lori tells me that her child is in danger so I'm not sure what to believe or understand what's going on this time I I'm very confused okay did you speak to any law enforcement that day yes uh, what interaction did you have uh, do you know which law enforcement agency you spoke with that day Gilbert police okay and do you Recall if there was a specific individual you spoke with that day from Gilbert Police? Officer Ryan Pillar. I'm sorry, can you say Officer that? Ryan Pillar. Ryan Pillar? Correct. And do you know how that last name is spelled? P I L L A R, I, or there could be a Y, so okay. I'm not for sure. Um, what contact did you have with uh, Officer Pillar that day? Um, he called me, left a message, and I returned his phone call. Okay. Um, what was the nature of your conversation with uh, Officer Pillar? He was responding to the Rexburg police and uh, was asking about JJ and his whereabouts. Okay, and what did you tell him? I told him that I had, I had um, been with JJ, but that he was back with Lori. Okay. Um, When you, when you said you had been with him, what did, what did you mean by that? That he uh, was with me, um, and then she came to get him. Okay. So that it would turn the, the, the police back to Rexburg and not with me, because I, yeah. Now, uh, Ms. Gibb, uh, had you recently had JJ with you? No. So when you told Detective Pillar that you had, was that an accurate statement? No, it was not. Okay. Um, and did you believe that JJ was actually with Lori at that time? I was not sure. Okay. Um, so was that, pursuant to the knowledge you had, was that an accurate statement? Yeah. Okay. Um, but you, did you also tell Detective Pillar that JJ was not with you? Correct. And was that an accurate statement? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a reason you, you told Detective Pillar you had had him? Yes, because Lori was misleading and she was manipulating me or trying to convince me that, that he and she was in danger. And so because of our friendship, I thought, I have really no idea if this could be true or not. And I was very perplexed, very troubled, and I really did not know what to do. I was trying to reconcile all these feelings I had. Okay. Um, did you have any subsequent uh, contact with the Gilbert Police Department? Yes. Uh, and do you recall approximately when that was? I believe it was December 7th or 8th. Okay. And what, what contact did you have with the Gilbert Police Department? I called Officer Pillar and 
I informed him that um, who I was and um, that probably a lot more detail about the conversation about what happened um, about JJ and Lori and Chad and I also had something that I had recorded that I wanted to give to him. Okay. Uh, let's talk about that. What had you recorded that you wanted to give to Officer Pillar? I recorded a conversation um, with Chad and Lori on Chad Daybell's phone. Uh, about 21 minute conversation. Um, and that conversation was about where was JJ? The conversation talked about why did you tell the police that I had JJ when I did not? And she explained that. And I also explained to her my concern for her, for her salvation and Chad's and that they had been very deceived. And I also wanted to make sure that the police knew that I did not have anything to do with this. Okay. Uh, how did you record that conversation? On a cell phone. Um, okay. You mentioned earlier uh, the conversation was on Chad's, was with Chad's number? Correct. Was that the same number you discussed earlier? Correct. Okay. And what phone did you use to have this conversation? my phone and, and then I had a recorder phone on David Warwick's and so I put my phone on speaker and then I recorded it with his phone. Okay. Uh, had law enforcement asked you to uh, to record a conversation with uh, Mrs. Vallow or, or Mr. Daybell? No. Okay. So this was something you did of your own accord? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you remember, and maybe you already answered this, uh, what day you made that recording? December 8th. And where were you located when you made that recording? I was in David Warwick's home. I'm sorry, where? I was in David's home. Oh, okay, David Warwick's home. Yes. Okay, I apologize, I misheard you. Um, and again, is that the same home in Pleasant Grove, Utah? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, the state would ask that state's exhibit that is in marked as uh, exhibit 19 be shown to the defense and handed to the witness. Exhibit 19 is being handed to the witness. Uh, Ms. Gibb, do you recognize uh, ex the state's exhibit 19? Yes. Have you seen it before? Yes. Uh, have you uh, reviewed the contents of that disc? Yes. Um, and when did you when did you review the contents of that disc? Yesterday. Okay. And uh, what 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 is on that disc? It's the exact conversation that I recorded on my phone. Okay. And is that the same conversation you shared with law enforcement? Yes. And was it Detective Pillar that you shared that with? Yes. Okay. And the recording on that disc, is it a true and accurate representation of the original recording you made? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, the state would ask that um, State's Exhibit 19 be entered into evidence. No objection. Exhibit 19 will be admitted. Your Honor, the state would request that uh, Exhibit 19 be published. Right, would you like to publish that on the screen here that's hanging on the wall? Yes, Your Honor. Is there video and audio or just audio? Just audio. Miss Warwick, or excuse me, Miss uh, Gibb, if you'll hand that exhibit to Madam Bailiff. Madam Bailiff, was there another disc in there? Yes. Will you please hand that disc to Mr. Wood so that he can identify it and we can make sure that that gets put into evidence? Your Honor, that is, um, that is State's Exhibit 14. It's no longer in the case with the marker. 
Okay. Your Honor, would you like me to hand this to the bailiff or? Yes, please hand it to the bailiff. Madam Bailiff, do you have the envelope that shows? Okay, Exhibit 14. All right, and Madam Bailiff, or Mr. Wood, uh, the disc that has been placed in the television at this point is Exhibit 19, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And you're moving to publish that? Yes. Mr. Pryor, any objection to publishing Exhibit 19? No objection, Judge, thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Wood. Thank you. Your Honor, we seem to be having a similar problem earlier. I think it's a really good time for a break. It's getting extremely hot in here again. We'll take 15 <laughs> minutes so we can cool it down in here, and we'll uh, reconvene here in 15. Thank you. Please be seated. We'll be back on the record in State versus Daybell. The court took a brief recess to cool the courtroom down, the air conditioner, as well as to allow Mr. Wood some time to get his technology ready. Mr. Wood, uh, do you wish to proceed with publishing Exhibit 19? Yes, Your Honor. You may do so. This is a recording on December 8th at 3.43 p.m. And I am calling Chad Day Bell's phone number, and hopefully I will be talking to both of them, Chad and Lori. So here goes the phone call. Sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Hi. Hey, let me put on speaker. Oh, okay. All right. We're enough with the phone. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys? We're okay. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, where, <laughs> where are you guys? We're just hanging out. Hanging out? <laughs> are, you, are you in Idaho? We're no. in Idaho. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah, um, I want to know, um, you remember we talked about JJ going to Case House, and you told me they went there, and now he's not there? I was wondering what happened. 
Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions. So was she was she doing something? Like was she trying to come get him or something, or like trying to kidnap him? Well, she's yeah, she said that lots of times before, but um. Okay. I, well, when, you know, when I asked Chad the other day, I was like, hey, um, you know, where, where is JJ? And he said, for my security, he didn't want me to know. So is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? <laughs> no, it's nobody. It's his danger. It's the danger that there's people after me. Okay. So, so if you knew, that puts you in a danger. Well, just in a bad position. Yeah, bad position. Everybody, if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know. Right, so you're just worried. Okay. Um, I'm just to keep him protected and... And keep you protected. And keep everybody else protected. I appreciate that. Um, Well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. I just needed to use, have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Oh, uh, yeah. So is it, do you think it's like your family or, you know, like your family, your dad or, you know, those well, my people? Family, well, not my whole family, but you, as you know, most of my family is working against me and yeah. with her, basically. Yeah. Is JJ safe? She is safe and happy. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Um, are you afraid of anything? Like, are you afraid to tell me that you're just afraid that he, um, that I could be in danger? Like, you're, you know, like, I don't, like, if I knew, like, how could that hurt me? I don't understand how that could hurt me if I knew where he was. Well, I'm just not telling anybody so that nobody has to say where he is or get questioned to where he is so I can keep him as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, okay, I hope well, I hope that he's okay. I hope you guys are okay. I did have a question that I asked Al at one point, your brother, um, if, um, if I wanted to know, you know, um, like where he was and... He said, I did not want to know, and that he could not be found. So what does that mean? I don't know why he would say that, but it's the same story. Like, I yeah. I, I, I don't even want Al to know. I don't want anybody to know so that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be yeah. questioned about it so he can be safe. Yeah, so are you, I mean, are you, how, how long are you going to be away for? Like, how, I mean, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? Or are you going to keep, you know, like, come back? I mean, like, what does that look like? I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day, so. Okay. Well, I just wondered if I was ever going to see you again. Absolutely, you will. Okay, so. Yep. So maybe when they're done chasing you, you'll be able to come out of, you'll be able to come out again, or? Yeah, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing for them to be working with Kay to find me. There's nothing that's gone on that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're working mm-hmm. with her in some dark capacity. The police mm-hmm. are working with her in some mm-hmm. dark capacity. There's no reason for them to be after me mm-hmm. in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, has she has she threatened you at all? Yes, lots of times. Oh boy. Like she, what did she say? Well, it's in emails and everything. So hmm. So like she said she was gonna come take him or she was There's a lot of things. Yeah. Nelly. Well, I know it sounds like it. I'm just worried for you guys because you know, he's missing, and, you know... <laughs> I know exactly where he is. He's perfectly okay. fine and happy. Okay, well, I hope so. I had a scripture I wanted to share with you, if you don't mind. I love it. I was thinking about some of the things you guys have gone through. 
and I saw the scripture today, and I wanted to I want you to let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question yeah. about a scripture. Okay. So, did Alma turn himself into King Noah? Or what did, was he required to do? Well, King Noah was incredibly wicked. Yes. And so he he fled his his evil ways, which was which was adultery and and right, living riotously and breaking all the commandments. Right. So what did man. he? What was he required to do, Alma? He had to go and flee so that he would um, be safe and then help other people realize how you know jacked up the system was and the government was. What about Moroni? What was he required to do at the end? To to carry on those plates and bury them. That was his what responsibility. What did he have to do to do that? What did he have to do to do that? Did well, he, he hide? He had to hide. He, he had to hide because they were so. Um, oh. They were so. Um, everybody was killing everybody in the society. Everybody was dying. They were well, killing all the Nephites. Felt in the scriptures had to hide in the cavity of a rock by day and go out by night. The, prof- the prophets. That. The prophets did. They did. Yeah. Okay, so well, thank you for sharing that with me. Okay, I just, that this scripture is just something that may be thoughtful for you. For behold, this is Dr. and Covenant section 3, verse 7 and 8. It says, For behold, you should not have feared man more than God, although men set not the counsels of God and despise his words. Yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. He would have been with you in every trouble. So when we work with the Lord and are obedient, he has... He's going to protect us from adversarial darts and all kinds of negativity. But when we open the door to Satan, he comes in and then he attacks. And then he takes away to make it look like somebody else took it away. But that's not how God works. He doesn't work in darkness. I agree with you 100%. And that's what the Lord is doing for me. Exactly what he's doing for me. Well, it just, it just, it just we sounds have not weird. We have the door for darkness now. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. And I promise you that I have done nothing wrong in this case, but sometimes you have to hide in a cavity of a rock for your own life safety. And that's what the Lord requires of you sometimes. And that's how it is. And I'm sorry that's how it is because there is a lot of darkness on the earth. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. This spring after me for zero reason besides the darkness of Kay which you already know she's dark I, I I haven't met her enough to know if she's dark or not I've just met her slightly and she seemed like a normal kind of person but then I haven't engaged with her that much so I don't know that personally so you don't know about her changing the thing to for herself to be the beneficiary of the policy and all that stuff none of that's dark right well I haven't seen those documents so I have no way of knowing You've seen them on my computer. No, I have not. I haven't even looked in on your computer before. You haven't shown me anything. I don't know why you're being controversial to me or if you're recording this conversation for the police or whatever. I don't know what your intention is on this phone call. Well, but I love with all my heart, and I have forever, and well, I will always see you. I appreciate those words, but if you really love me, you wouldn't have told the police that I had JJ with me. That's not, that's not what a friend does. I mean, that just makes me look weird, and it, it just, it's not safe for me. That doesn't look good. I mean, you had to think of my welfare if you love me. I do, and I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. And I appreciate you, and I love you. I love and I will never do anything to harm you, and you can have all of this confirmed to you by the Lord. I have. And my my conscience is clear. I feel very understanding what's really going on, Lori. And I believe that look, I believe that you have been very deceived by Satan. I believe that he has tricked you. And I just I don't believe that what you're doing is correct. I just don't I mean, Tammy dies and then your husband died. And then these, and then he's missing. It just doesn't sound like God's plan to me. It just sounds. It gives me a gut feeling. Like in my gut, it feels weird. It doesn't feel right. I don't have peace about it. I never have felt 100% peace about it. I always felt like a little weird in my stomach about all these things. You know me, Mel. You know me. 
this does not sound like you. This sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear, and have fear of the celestial world. I don't have fear. You obviously do. No, I have a peace of conscience, and I can see clearly. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I love you so much. I know you do. I don't know what else to say. Sam, Christ, when he comes again, and he's coming soon, and we will all stand there, and you will know at that point that he has supported me and has supported me the whole time, and I have not been deceived. I just want to testify that I I know Tammy was at the conspiracy theories. My sister-in-law is right behind it all, and I hope that you're not being influenced by that dark team. I don't know who she is. I'm sorry, you said your sister-in-law? I don't even know her. Oh, I know, but she's coming up with the same type of theories. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. My own children were there. They testified that... Tammy had been getting weaker and sick, and I begged her to go to the doctor. There's, she just, her heart was failing her. She was physically falling apart, but she hates doctors, and she just passed away. Um, that's how it happened. My son Garth was right there with me the whole time. My kids were with, at the house within a 20 minutes of her passing. Like, there were two coroners. They checked her out right there on the bed. All these conspiracy theories just make me sick to my stomach. Uh, just absolutely sick. I know I've been told for years that Tammy would pass away at a young age. Mm -hmm. and I had no idea that Lori would even be a part of my life. I just knew that I, my life had two segments. And that I know Tammy's on a special mission and she's with my kids. She's visited them. Just, there's so much, Melody, that you, you just have to have faith, and this is not some sort of master plan. There's no way, Logan, I could ever come up with this. It's just... You can understand my concern, correct? I can, from an outside perspective, but from an... From someone who knows as much as you know? No, not really. <laughs> but we can feel Dave's influence on you. I can feel that, for sure. He's a very good man, and he has a very strong foundation, that I know. I know, but he seems to be the one that's putting the doubts in your mind. No, you no, the, the, you know what, I have, I have come to understand that my gut feeling, I was not listening to it. And I always felt uncomfortable with uh, many things. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that I included you in those teachings then for your own sake because I wish that you didn't have as much knowledge as you have as you will be accountable for the knowledge that you do have, Mo. So will you. I so agree, you. Yeah, oh, so I, I have no fear. Yeah. I have no fear of that. Yeah. But I but really, look, I, you know, oh, as I was, I, I was reading the story of Korahor, and it is so very similar to this, you just can't see it. But he did it because... He was trying to reclaim a people, and he thought at the very end, because of his carnal and natural desires, that's what influenced him. And he was very, very deceiving. Carnal and natural desires? Well, honey, you got a lot of natural desires. We all know that. That's what you think is me, Korahor? Are you kidding me right now? I think both of you have, have similar, right now. similarities. It's in the scriptures. It's in the scriptures, and the scriptures are very powerful. Yes, they are. I live by the scriptures, as you know. I know, but we can rest the scriptures for our own vain glory. I rested the scriptures? We can. We can do that, and I feel that you have to, to see our, our belief systems. Do I rest the scriptures? Is that what you're accusing me of at this point? I feel that you have. How? Why do you feel that way? I need an explanation on this. Because if you look, like the scripture just shared. Okay, the you read scriptures. scriptures every single day, you know? I, I, well, I know you read them. I don't doubt that. But the, this scripture right here says that you will be supported by all against the fiery darks of the adversary. You would have been supported if you had not opened dark portals and dark junk. You would have been safe 
if you would have obeyed God, he would have had your back. But you have been chased and tortured. I wonder and... if you do this or not. I'm sorry? He has your back. So. Well, if he has your back, you would not not be able to tell me where you are. And we couldn't find JJ. Like, where is he? I've been asking, where is he? And you know what I mean? Like, that's. I can tell everybody where JJ is right now, and that would not be good for JJ. So I'm sorry that you don't want me to protect my children, but I would never ask you to not protect your children. Of course you wouldn't. So I can tell that you're just adversarial, Mel. I love you. I'm sorry that you feel this way. Because I actually do care, I'm sharing what I feel for you because I know your salvation's in trouble for what you've done. If my salvation is not in trouble at all, and I think you should check that with the Lord again. Oh, I, I, I felt a lot of things from the Lord, and this doesn't feel right. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way, sweetheart. I'm sorry that you are friends with all those who are against me. Joseph Smith's friends turned not, against me. I'm not, a friend, I'm not friends with people that are against you. Apparently you are. I am not. I don't know Kay. I don't know who you're talking about. Your sister, I don't even know what her name or who she is. I don't know any of those people. Why would they contact me anyway? How would I even know about that? Well, you're friends with Dave, and he's well, apparently well, sweet now. Well, David is a very righteous man, and um, I've always known that grounding about him. And he has a lot of beautiful experiences with the Lord, and these are not the same. You know, when you get the priesthood, that's Peter, James, and John shows up, and then he confirms all of those in the circle that are to get it, and everybody's a witness of that. Everybody's a witness that the pattern is in the scriptures. There's no witness that you ever receive what you think you receive. Nobody has seen that but you. There's no witness. The witness, Joseph Smith, Oliver Calvary, Martin Harris, the eight witnesses, they all showed up. Is there a witness that Jesus, Heavenly Father, gave that to Joseph Smith by himself in the grove? Was there a witness? No, but they had no. it later with other people. That was one experience, but others joined in later. When he brought other people into it, they had experiences. Is that in the scriptures, yes or no? I'm sorry? Is that in the scriptures, yes or no? That, that Joseph was alone when he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes, he was alone. He was alone. But he okay. had to open it up That's first. That's not a pattern at all. Honey, what I'm saying is, is that after he saw that and other people joined in, they saw the things with him. He wasn't alone. There was a witness for them. There was no witness. Anybody's never seen what you've seen or experienced what you've seen. That's your own witness, but nobody's I don't, had that. No, God knows it, and I will never deny it. For my soul would be at stake if I did. So you can say it didn't happen to me, Mel, but if I say it, then I am accountable. You didn't witness it, okay, but, but I did. But your behaviors I, is not... Okay, Christ. I understand that's what you, you believe you saw, but this is the thing, as I see is that your behavior is not one of somebody Never that's in Christ. Your behavior. Your behavior. What? Never had any idea that you would be the person of all people to turn me. I cannot believe I am that. asking questions, and I am concerned for you. That is what somebody does when they care. You don't sound like you're concerned. You sound like you're accusatory. You do not sound concerned. You sound pissed off. I'm not. I am very. Uh, I am troubled. Maybe that's the better word. Troubled. Because these things, like you being with Chad before he's even divorced, is unusual behavior for a person that sees Jesus not, Christ. I was never with him, and he was never divorced. Honey, I've seen you that's guys together. Story. That's oh, oh so I haven't ever seen heart. you with, I've never seen you with Chad kiss him and walk around the track at BYU with him. I never saw that. You say you're the one that's just feeling guilty about being with someone before they were divorced. Oh, honey. I think that's not what we're talking about here. Wait, it's not what we're talking about here. That's what I'm saying. You are going off the deep end. Well, I'm just saying this is not a behavior of someone that sees Jesus Christ. It's not the behavior. Really? Have you ever seen Jesus Christ? So do you know what the future behavior would be if you had seen Jesus Christ? I know that when I I know that when I pray. Each of you every day, and he does protect me, and he is protecting me, and he will protect me against this accusation as well. And we will both stand there with him, and 
you tell me if I was lying or not. But well, we're both standing there with Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, Skip, was that the natural ending of that conversation? I'm sorry? Was that was that how that conversation ended? The phone cut off. I could have been because it was in a basement apartment. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. Mr. Pryor, looks like we have about 10 minutes until 5 o'clock. Can you give me an idea of uh, how long you foresee the cross-examination taking here? Judge, I anticipate much more than 10 minutes. Um, I spoke with Mr. Wood, and I, we thought it was best if, if the court would oblige us and, and forego the next 10 minutes and allow me to start my cross in the morning. If that's acceptable to the court, I would respectfully ask that. We will recess for the day. Um, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Are there any issues? Uh, well, first of all, let's, let's grab that disc out of the player right now, Madam Bailiff. Madam Bailiff, are there any other exhibits that are attached to the easel? We'll take those exhibits right now. Clerks, just so we're clear, do we have all exhibits in our possession 1 through 19 at this juncture? We'll reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Mr. Wood, Mr. Pryor, is there anything else that we need to take up here today? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Judge, are we excused? We are. Thank you, Your Honor. All rise.